is up, Theology Nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast. That's right. This is your audiological connection to this doctor of theology, talking to others, trying to bring the nerdy goodness out of the academy right into your earpiece. And today on the podcast, you're going to get to meet a whole bunch of my friends at McAfee School of Theology in the ATL, the Dirty South, Atlanta. That's right, this, or well, not everything that happened, but some of the highlights from a live Homebrewed Christianity podcast in Atlanta with my friends from the McAfee School of Theology. That would be the Divinity School at Mercer University. And it, it was so much fun. We got nerdy about all sorts of things like science fiction and and, and Star Wars and uh, Battlestar Galactica and things. Then we got we started wrestling with scripture and what it means, its authority and place and interpretation in the life of the church. And then we started talking about the changing shape of vocation for you as a minister, for the church in general, how it engages culture. And then it just kept going. We had it. We even played a little game. Uh huh. Yeah, we played some theological games. It happens in a live homebrewed podcast. Well, that's what's about to happen. And before we jump into that episode, I want to give you. One big heads up. Go to theologybeercamp.com. What trip? Yes, go to theologybeercamp.com on the birthday of homebrewed Christianity. And the the tickets are going to go on sale for Theology Beer Camp this summer, this August 16th, 18th in Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, this is a three-day one-of-a-kind craft beer and theology nerd experience you don't want to miss out. And there's only 99 seats because we're in a brewery. That's right. Theology Beer Camp is leveling up his beer nerdiness by the things taking place in a stinking brewery. Brooder, brooderty, brooderty. Trip can't talk. It's a brewery. A brewery is where the event shall take place. And it's in downtown Asheville. You'll also be getting to taste the wonderful craft beer goodness of what? Asheville and the North Cagalac. There's going to be so much excitement. You can get some secrets as to what's going on, but I will tell you something super special. The one and only Robin Henderson Espinoza is going to be in the house. That's right, activist theologian in chief. Mm Mm-hmm. Boom. And Travis McMacken is going to be there. You may be saying to yourself right now, oh, oh, trip. Uh, are, Are you telling me that this event is basically three days with delicious craft beer, super amazing nerdiness. How can I even plan and prepare for such a thing? No, it's not even just that. There's more. But you got to go to theologybeercamp.com to find out. And there, you can click a little button, put your email in, so that you get tickets before they go on sale. There'll be like a 24-hour period that anyone that signed up can get tickets, and they'll get them cheaper than everyone else. They'll get them $50 cheaper than everyone else for that first 24-hour period because it's the birthday of homebrewed Christianity. Anyway, that's all I got for that. Now, Mercer, they have a school of theology called McAfee. I was there, and uh, let me tell you about the people. People at that place are great. They're amazing. Really, I was there for two days. I got to hop in to a class with Dr. Nash, did a little talking about religious pluralism, secularism, the changing shape of our religious identity, how that impacts how we understand our mission and such in the world. I got to join the Dean Jeff Willits in a philosophy for theology class. And, um, you know, he's like, Trip, I just want to know if you have any thoughts about Alfred North Whitehead. And I gave an introduction to Whitehead and then interacted with the students. And it was so much fun. I preached. I did preach. And uh, then got plenty of hangout time. So it's always fun when I get to visit schools. And, uh, and basically I tell them, hey, I'll do whatever you want me to do while I'm there. So I preached, visited two classes, did a lunch and learn, and this live podcast. And it was amazing and exciting as a live podcast is. If you or someone thinking about trying to find a place to do some theological reflection, especially if you're in the Atlanta area, there's no better place than McAfee. Why? 
Because I've met a whole bunch of the students, and they're awesome. And as amazing as theology professors can be, as the people who are introducing you to the scriptures and the history of the church and ethics and all that kind of stuff are, theological education is intensely informed and enriched by the people you do it with. So, you know, I met a lot of the students and they're awesome. So think about it. If you want links to McAfee, you can go to the Homebrew Christianity website or just type it in on the internet. Um, and in one thing, one thing before we hop in this, for all you that came out, Atlantaites, it was awesome. We packed out Old Manny's, Old Man Wells Tavern in uh, in Atlanta, and we had ourselves a nerdy old time. So. Buckle your theological safety belts, my friends. It's time to get live with our theological reflection. Peace. Now the official podcast is starting. That was like the preface statement. And if you're from Mercer then you got to help me welcome Graham Walker up here because it's fantastic to be here and it's a podcast so you have to use the microphone oh. lean forward lean forward yeah it's good to be here i just got back off the plane from taiwan Throat's about gone, but it's great to see all of y'all here. I know I have groups over here that are representing from McAfee and over here, and the Beard Brothers are here. Oh, yes, and McAfee over here as well. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of a great thing to be here with Trip. We go back and uh, a long way. We are brothers by different mothers. Um, yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, Frank Tupper was our theologian. We both studied with Frank. He uh, was at um, uh, Wake and um, Divinity School and when Tripp was there. But he was my uh, Ph.D. professor at Southern Seminary in the 80s. And, uh, I mean, this guy is a wild hair theologian. He's a cowboy theologian. He's a... Uh, he's, he's, I just can give you some examples of his life. When The very first time I met him, um, no, when he told me about you, okay, like, go ahead. Shoot. The, you know, theologians are not normally socially capable. No, that's why the church invented theological education. Yeah, so the true. people that have the heart of a minister, the brain of a nerd, but the social skills of a librarian, Whoa, they can teach in the divinity yeah. school. Um, and yeah. there, no one ever tells them they're going in debt. They have to listen. They think I'm the greatest preacher of all time. Well, Frank, Frank, uh, says to me, uh, it says, now trip, trip, like that, trip, trip. I need you to meet my my son, Gramp. You're going to be doing my funeral with him. <laughs> Literally said that. Literally yeah. said, we we are working on his funeral now because he has set it up. I know. I mean, like, it's very rare you plan your second date no. <laughs> we're at a funeral, and we're going to tag team preach it. And I and went my he preached my ordination sermon. Without exaggerating, topped 110 minutes. Not the oh, service, oh, the sermon. Yeah. Oh, because he yeah. had, he got hurt That's and so... decided he should take his second Vicodin early. Oh, yes. And he was full of the Lord. And he was wrapping it up right at about 40 minutes. And then he said, now, Tripp, I, I wasn't sure I was going to say this. But I think I'm going to. Oh, man. I hope the Lord blesses you with a dark night of the soul. Oh, <laughs> and he proceeds to describe just how bad he hopes my life happens early on so that I come to trust the God revealed in the crucified one deep enough that my theology is, quote, in my, conf in my ordination sermon, worth a damn the day after. And that's that's true. A dark night in the in the soul is what he was always preaching. And you know, he get this trip. I had a choice between going to Rushlakan, 
Switzerland after graduation or the Philippines during a coup attempt. He says, Ram, I think you need to go to the Philippines. And that's where I ended up. Why? Because you need a little action in your life, a little revolution to go with it. So there you go. So uh, most people that... uh, so Frank last year was the most popular podcast on homebrewed Christianity, and it was like in oh. December, uh, and it was over two hours, and wow. that was the edited version. Wow. Uh, because we got going, and he was at my house, and he said <laughs> halfway through, he's like, he said, is there another, is there, is there more, is there more uh, wine? Because, I mean, I'm staying here, Trip. Yeah. You should open up some more of that wine. Oh, no. Because my wife is a very big wine person, and she has, like, nice wine. So she, like, pulled out nice wine for Frank, and Frank's like, well, as long as we're talking, let's just get that nice wine. And uh, we, we talk for two hours, and I'm like, I hope there's gold in here because this is about as much fun as I have. And we get done. We're putting it up, and he goes, well, I just really hope one time you can sit down for a couple hours, drink a while, and do one with Graham. <laughs> and... uh I was like, that's what goes through your mind when you're wrapping up? You know, he had told his whole wild. story with him and Betty and her oh, yeah. death oh, yeah. and being a single parent yeah, and, oh, yeah, and yeah. all that. And, and then he gets done and he's all back, back to the funeral. Let wow. me make sure you do, you do this with Graham. And, and, and now he does it in the most funny way, but, uh, and, and, but what, you get when you spend time with a theologian who takes their mm-hmm. own finitude that seriously mm-hmm. is a recognition that your day-to-day life, the relationships you have around you, the loved ones you interact with, the opportunities to move towards beauty and justice and things aren't trivial. They're gifts. Yeah. And the, the, faith, the language we use for your faith, the, the stories you tell, the songs you sing are not just to help you cling on. They're to help you to move on yeah. in spite of the fact life can ex- be experienced and be arbitrary. And God's not. And that's... Uh, yeah. A Tupperism. Yeah, that's very Tupper. Um, I was his grad student, and he had me out at his house all the time doing cheap labor for him. And uh, while doing a fence, he says, Ram? He never called me Graham. It was always Ram. It seemed to work out that way. And he had me, he called me over, he says, I've been and had a biopsy on my leg, and i got to show it to you. I said, it's fine, Frank, it's fine. I don't need to see this. And he said, no, you got to see it. He began to unbuckle his pants in the front yard. And he drops his pants, and he's standing there in his BVDs, and he says, look at this. And he's showing me the scar down his leg, and he says, looks like two pieces of Kroger beef tied together. I'm going, oh, wow, this is not what I needed to see. But this is a guy who lived. Which officially, if you go to Mercer, Graham does not show you post-surgery cleanup. No, I just, no, I don't just, show you just that. want to make no, sure this is no, clear. No, no, no. Like I said, this is something I didn't need to see. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. But, but, but Frank does. He lives a theology and lived a theology and taught teaching it between the spirituals and the blues. It's the Saturday night pain of life, and it's the Sunday morning recognition of the joy of life. James Cohn had it right that uh, you do live on that edge between the spirituals and the blues. So what was the moment post-divinity school and theological education where – the questions you have, the thinkers you wrestled with, the experiences there kind of condensed at a moment in your life where the experience and struggle you had animated the tradition you'd wrestled with and received. Yeah, so after after seminary for us, my wife and family, we got on a got on a plane and flew to the Philippines. And we did our yeah, yeah. We did our language study and um you know, as far away from English as we could and moved up to Baguio. But it wasn't until um, the military bases said they were leaving. And we recognized with all the revolution that was taking place that this really is an important factor for us. The, the, uh, a lot of the students said, I guess the military bases are leaving. I guess that means you all are leaving too, right? And, and, you know, that, that really made me pause. It said, wow, the association of Christianity is so tied to the power of the weapons that brought the colonial powers here that that's the assumption they make. So it really hit me that now the real test begins. 
Now it really shows. Now your theology shows in the trenches, so to speak, of real life, because you're not going to be counting on the imperial powers to support your Christianity. It's a theology of the cross. It's a recognition that it's not triumphalism. And that's where we're going in this country, too. We're headed in that direction. The Christendom that you mentioned is on decline, and we are looking at where we go next. And so for me, that's where it all kind of came together. So Frank's kind of theology of the cross, his theology of passion, his recognition that God is is found in the God forsakenness of life where Jesus is really shows that kind of incarnation that we're looking at. So one of the things that uh, I constantly dealt with, I just moved back to North Carolina from spending 10 years in Los Angeles. In process theology, wasn't that it? Uh, well, I did not leave that behind. Oh, you should have. Um, are you like we have a short amount of time? Like that's like baiting a long discussion. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I don't really, I'm, the that's dangerous. Why would you do that? To yeah. So yeah, everyone okay. can Go, take home their Marjorie Go Sue ahead. Hockey and no. John Cobb trading cards over no, there. Oh yeah, those are great. Uh, and I don't know. I don't want to say this is providential, but John Cobb's initials are JC. <laughs> yeah, just saying. Um, so are John Calvin, so it doesn't work oh, for yeah. him. But so descri- describe to me how your Baptist identity has changed in one losing the cultural privilege of being, you know, the, what Bill Leonard called uh, 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 the uh, the king of Christendom in the South. Uh, when yeah. the when the takeover or the fall happens uh, <laughs> in, in Southern Baptist life, to now just the removal of the cultural privilege for Protestant Christianity. Yeah. Like how what does ba- your own Baptist identity look like uh kind of post Southern Rome, post uh Christendom? Yeah, so the decentralization of that Southern religion. Um so I I grew up as a as a kid inside the First Baptist Church of Orlando. It's a great place to be. However, what I ended up doing was uh, finding myself in Singapore. My parents became missionaries with the SBC. They brought me back to the United States, dropped me off in Tallahassee, Florida, to be raised by the Seminoles of uh, FSU. And, uh, yeah, there's uh, Seminole, um, yes. And and uh, I, I found myself in a kind of a re- education program about what that southern privilege was all about. And it kind of shocked me just how white my Christianity was back here in the United States, how powerful it was back here. And so what we're seeing now, a kind of a a decline in that direction, really mirrors what the rest of the world, what the rest of Christianity and the two-thirds world looks like. So you could say that it's a decline, but you could also say it's a qualitative step forward. And our Baptist life with its decentralized organization pattern has a tendency towards a more cultish identity, no doubt, because we're like potatoes in the soup where we live. Whatever, whatever it is around us culturally, that's what it's going to taste like. So we have to kind of work with that. But there's an enormous power that we have in becoming uh, the smaller communities, the more incarnational communities to reach out. But it's going to take some theological education. We got to be tied to our church history. We got to be tied to our understanding of scriptures. We have to go back and and find and tap into those incredible sources that we had before. So that's you know that's where I see it. That's where I see it going fantastic directions. All right, now Dr. Garber is going to be walking up here to join you for some conversation. So the word on the street is that one faculty member clarified how to spell a certain nerd vocabulary word used in the promotion for this event, and that it was you. Excuse me? And Nathan, isn't this true? That, that he emailed that Cylon was spelled incorrectly? Oh, yes, 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 that's correct. Yes. So correct? It, It's not a cyclone, no. No, it's not. Now, you're a biblical scholar, but... If you're apparently, a, yeah, I know. But if you're a hardcore nerd, I then, prefer the term geek. But yeah, if you're a hardcore geek, if you nerd out with your geek out, then your geeky identity is almost. It's like the next. It's the next peel of the onion after Jesus. You know what I mean? Like if you've been a geek before geeky became cool, 
Then all of a sudden, the rest of America was like, hey, remember those things you've loved for a long time? We now like them. Oh, yeah. 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 So tell me about your geeky conversion story. My geeky conversion story? Yeah, like story? when you got interested in the questions of geekydom. I, I, don't, I think I was born into it. Like most of – a lot of our students are born into the church. I think I was born into it. Yeah. But my first, my first movie was Star Wars 1977. So, isn't that like the geek equivalent of I walk the aisle at a Billy Graham revival? Yes. My first movie memory is Chewbacca combing his hair back. So, yeah. that's like, I mean, it's appropriate. We just finished Transfiguration Sunday, and uh, you left the left the the cinema just, which. No, my grandmother was like uh, an extremely conservative Baptist, and she said that cinemas had the word sin in it for a reason. <laughs> I know. Yeah, and she was worried about E.T. You're like, you're befriending aliens, you'll befriend everything. And uh, so when, when you start to, how do y'all understand the way as a culture where we no longer have one shared meta, meta narrative like Christianity and such, uh, culture asking questions about itself, what it means to be human and all that through uh, these big narratives that seize us and grasp us in pop culture? It's a good question. Um, <laughs> I think part of it is just the power of, of story, the power of myth. Um, I think one of the things that I kind of uh, pieced together as I was coming through the church while I was being in, in, ingrained with this culture um, is that uh, what I longed for in the other, what I longed for in God came from that power in, in narrative. Um, and uh, so I, I knew I was being uh, led down a wrong path when I went to summer camp and they said, Everything in Star Wars is of the devil. Um, I knew that 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 was that was wrong. Was that like um, that was like right after they told you that Jonah was in a well literally for three yes, days? Exactly, exactly. Um, You're like, so yeah, oh, why would I trust these people? Right, right, right. And um, so I always go back to Obi Wan's message. You know, all all about truth from a certain point of view, um, and that really kind of laid the foundation for my hermeneutic, I suppose. <laughs> So how do you, so uh, Graham? How do you see theology being a conversation cultures having without being fully aware they're asking theological questions? Well, um, w w what you're looking at, what you're looking at with theology for me is a redescription of reality. So fictions for me function in a beautiful way. They allow me to see the details of where I'm living right now in a contained world, and thus I can look at it and describe it and see which way I want to change the present that I'm in right now. It's complex moment that we live in the present. And so fiction operates as a way for me to take a look at that and redescribe it and implot a different pattern. Because I really believe that theology is about God providing us a story from beyond our own human schemings in such a way that we can make a difference in the world in which we live. And fiction helps us do that. So I totally need that, that sense of fiction to be able to see what's going on. It gives me, it gives me perspective. It gives me a moment to examine that. When um, in, in Paul Tillich's theology of culture and, and his, well, his entire theology of culture, not just the book, uh, he one of the things he emphasizes is that like from most of Western history, there was this one shared meta narrative where the God of Abraham created the world and has an right. end established. Right. And so, when you have times of turmoil and uh, and upturns and and uh, the apocalyptic imagination of the church comes up, yeah. but that apocalypse is always set in the context where we know where we came from and where we're going, mm -hmm. and in a in a more kind of secular age where there are every sacred story on one street and plenty of people that are nicer than all the different religious people right. without one, then when we get in a time of intense change and we go, we know the world as it is is changing, but we can't imagine what it looks like. 
Like, what does the world look like not organized by nation states with global right. capitalism? Right. And people go, I don't know, but we need it. Right? So right, right, right. we just like throughout church history when you have apocalyptic moments, there, this apocalyptic fever happens. In our context, they come up using the resources that geeks have been developing for years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they ask the same questions. Yeah. What does it mean to be human? What is the good? Is there a telos? Yeah. What is community? How do we have uh, – what does virtue even mean or look like and does it exist? Sure. And now we ask it with Cylons yes. and zombies. Yes. And we and, – and, and now even they're ruining what it means to be a Jedi or Sorry. they're having unique insights that we had no longer – we didn't anticipate. You're, um, you're correct on the latter one. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree. I just, you know, the internet's very upset about episode eight, and I was yeah. like, "What are you talking about? This is the greatest reorganization of what it means to be religious of all time." Right. And then most of the people, never mind. I was about to get it aside. <laughs> Last week it. I did a live podcast. This yeah. came up. Someone made a comment, and 20 minutes later, the guests were like, "Oh, I hadn't thought about that, but you just did a sermon on." The Last Jedi, and only half the room has seen it. And I was, and then I was like, "Who hadn't seen it?" And like, people raise their hand. Way to go! And I'm like, "Why did you come here? Yeah, I, you haven't I, seen the go. Last Jedi, and you went to bed at night, like feeling okay. You know, like what's that about? That I mean, that's like almost like going to bed without your quiet time. You know. I, anyway, nice. <laughs> so I don't remember exactly where I was going, except. In a, in a, in a world where the, all the transcendence has been collapsed in the imminent plane, where we don't have a shared mer- meta narrative. Charles Taylor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We don't have an excursus on the secular age. That's uh, dangerous. You, but, you, you opened it. There you go. I know. But, so how do you, like, what are the insights for you <clears throat> that we've latched on to seemingly fiction narratives as ways to ask questions that if they were, you know, doing a Daniel seminar with you, you'd be like, Oh, we've been asking these junks for years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and uh, you mentioned Battlestar Galactica. Um, I think it is one of those television shows that asks those tough ethical questions. So um, say we all. So say we all, um, which is a liturgical pattern yes, that they uh, that they use in that show, um, and uh, they can ask those questions uh, kind of from a distance. Um, Literally, right? Because they they set this in a uh, sci-fi universe. Um, while there is politics involved in the narrative, um, we, we and we can identify certain brands of politics in the narrative, and there are theologies in the narrative. We can identify those. It's set in a comfortable place. So when I think about the Book of Daniel, for example, uh, and how most scholars, spoiler alert, say that it was written in the Greek period. <laughs> Yet they're using the Babylonian uh, <laughs> timeline. Uh, I can say, oh, well, that's they're doing something similar. They're trying to address issues that are happening in their current time with a different uh, set of narratives, partially as a as a as a um, uh, a literature of resistance, yep. uh, partially to speak in code, yep. um, and they're. They're essentially doing what a lot of science fiction, fantasy, whatever genre you're into, um, they're doing the same things using the power of narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, this Jan term I taught an intensive at Elon University. uh, And in Jan term there, it's like a three weeks every day for three hours. And uh, it's where they encourage them to take upper level classes out of their discipline. So they told me, oh, 10 to 12 people usually sign up. But if your class doesn't make, you don't teach. So I was like, I'm going to put as many keywords for undergrad students in this <laughs> syllabus that you've ever heard. And it was like post-secular apocalyptic imagination from Battlestar Galactica to zombies to the Game of Thrones. Nice. And, uh, and, and it was a full class. Uh, my syllabus, though, was written like it was a seminar. So I don't know if any of you have ever graded 35 essays by uh, 19-year-olds who just binge watched Game of Thrones for the first time. <laughs> but you, it, it was like it was like the time during like a if you work at a church where it's uh, stewardship season and you have all meetings and all personal conversations in order to make budget. 
that whole month you're like, they better pay me. Yeah. Uh, when you get uh, two days at the end of that short term to grade 35 papers uh, about from 19-year-olds about Battlestar and Heidegger, it's just special. Anyway, I say that because uh, one of the... One, I basically was like, I'm writing a book called The Nerd's Guide to Being Human, and I'm going to get you all to do all the research for me. Yeah. So you had to choose to binge watch and journal using all the dead philosophers I introduced in class, either Battlestar, Walking Dead, or Game of Thrones, and you could pick up any of the big philosophical questions. And the two that were the most popular, I'm not going to say anything they said, but from your experience at working with ministers, what do you think their intuitions around these two questions? These are the two big philosophy of religion questions they seized on regardless of the show. The one was, what does it mean to have a just society? And the other was, what does it mean to call something good? You know, and they went through the nine classical philosophy of religion questions, and those were the ones they picked. And uh, thinking of our our cultural situation where you have a colliding meta narratives and and that 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 essentially joining the Twitter stream during a new Game of Thrones episode is the closest you get to uh, Plato's Symposium. Um, what do you think's going on, and how to, what does that look for people wrestling with theological questions and not just nineteen uh, year old questions? Well, I think one of the things that's going on is. Um, you mentioned Twitter and social media. That that's all happening, but in addition to focusing on these huge questions, they're also building communities. And they, they call them fandoms, right? And so you've got your your Buffy fans, you've got your Whedonverse fans, same same group. You've got your Battlestar Galactica fans, Star Trek, Star Wars, and and all of these communities. And all of those communities are all forming their own canons. Yep. Um, and some some people reject the official canon. I have a student who currently rejects the official canon of Star Wars, um, as <laughs> and um, he uh, he refuses to watch the new movies um, mm-hmm. because a- after Disney bought them and got rid of the old canon, mm-hmm. um, it was like so there's this Christendom, kind of, yeah, you yeah. know, like mm-hmm. the Constantinian <laughs> fall. They're just waiting for the one true Baptist to pick up that bloodline and right, right, right. pure. <laughs> Um, so, so there, there's there there are these communities that that are 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 functioning communities, and they they take on almost a religious language, and a religious passion when they're arguing about what's canon and what's not, who's a fundamentalist and who's not, um, and so I think that's part of that power of narrative to bring the community together um, around these around these topics. And and uh, and maybe you can say a bit more about that because I have found. That in the communities of people who even argue about what is and isn't in canon, mm-hmm. are they're also the same ones that go like, but what if? Right? So what geeks do that Christians have the hardest time doing is thinking creatively about situations and questions the canon has never answered, right. inspired mm-hmm. by and trying to be faithful to what's already there. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's as if Christians can only like moonwalk into the future, staring <laughs> at the past. Yeah. Um, and, and can't like face forward and go, we're, we're still deciding, like, we're, we're arguing about like what's essential, what's canon, what's, what were the creeds or what are you committed to? But at the same time, that same community, if you were like, yeah, but if you got of the way, if you got rid of the way Chewbacca died in the pre Marvel right. Disney canon, then he could get a much cooler death. And, or not die. Or not or die, not die yeah. because you can always get a tall guy to get in the suit, and now you have R2, you have all the droids, and Chewbacca is a running character. Or, and this is Tripp's side theory, but I keep saying it on podcasts in hopes that someone listens and tells JJ, <laughs> or um, Chewbacca could be the one that uh, sets the force to right because Homeboy got pretty mad when Han Solo went down. And what if Kylo Ren is in this final lightsaber fight with Ray, And his sword goes up and she's like unconscious. And then it stops and you're like, oh no. Is she like force holding it? But then the lightsaber goes up even higher. And you're like, how's this happening? Chewbacca just ripped his hand off. Like a whole arm. And just wax him. And then in, in Wookiee voice, he's like, ah! 
Now, kids may not enjoy that version of it as much, but I personally would be like, boom, that's right. Chewbacca set the force to right the whole time. The one that has been silenced and never had little postscripts of what he said, he's the one the whole time. Then you could have like whole fan theories of what Chewbacca was saying the entire time because only Han understood him. And he's the secret Aristotle of the Star Wars universe. And this is what J.J. has to do to get back at someone ruining everything he set up in the next one. He's like, no, Chewbacca's a freaking philosopher and is going to rip off the lightsaber and whack it. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen, and I forgot what I was going to ask you, but I do think it's like Chewbacca being the centerpiece would would be like the, the theology from the underside in the Star Wars universe. Because if you remember, in uh, po- well, I guess it's secondary canon now. Han Solo, <laughs> until the Solo film comes out, and I hope he does this, frees Chewbacca from slavery, and then he has this type of life debt to him, and eventually their friendship gets to the point where he frees him and he chooses to stay. And what if he chooses to stay only to set things right at the end? I think it would be great. And it's basically like Star Wars Liberation Theology or something. I don't know. I... It's more like Star Wars Midrash. Mid-rash. Well, so, but, but that's you were, the, the question I think you were going to ask. Yeah, tell me about maybe, it. Maybe not. Um, but was was about how this affects interpretation. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, and, exactly. and why, why we were, uh, why, why we are so, um, rigid in our interpretation of scripture and we're not playful with it. We don't use yeah, our imaginations, no. right? And that's something that we can learn from the Jewish tradition, especially the tradition of Midrash, is that it, scriptural interpretation can be playful. Um, there are so many, one of the things I, I do in my Bible and popular culture class is, uh, we read Robert Alter alongside of, uh, the, the biblical text and alongside of these pop culture texts. And we talk about these gaps that are in the text, these things that the text doesn't tell you. And that's where the, the rabbis who composed Midrash did their play. Uh, and interpretation, we take it so seriously, but we might want to ask why so serious? Why are we, why are we? Doing it this way, why do we have to tie everything? And it, it goes down to our our desire to, to get everything right and, and doctrinally sound. But these narratives invite us to play. Um, so, so uh, why so serious? That was that was a Dark Knight reference, uh, which is yes. uh, by far the best Batman. Like if you ever going to go like read Batman comics, go for the Dark Knight. It's yeah. legit. Um, it's really good. So. When, when you get to asking questions, or so, like Telic talks about how culture itself, without even necessarily being conscious of the fact they're asking questions, keeps to generate new forms of the questions humans have asked in every culture over time. That our own finitude, our the fact that we know we're thrown in the world in this arbitrary place, like we're the sperm that won a race, who happen to be birth into this one family and this one religion this one time and this one class and this one race and this one place and that if all those things change we'd probably still love our mom but probably pray in a completely different language with different assumptions and uh, and at the same time every human that's been born knows it's born to suffer and die and freaks out and so culture keeps generating these questions and anxieties built around these questions, and they want to tell stories and wrestle with meaning and purpose and goals and the possibility of something more than just being aware of being on a dead-end trip. And uh, I find the fact that they're, that secular culture, in a sense, or just people who are unable to speak their sacred tongue in a public square, uh, found... Narratives geeks have been cultivating for years, the place they latched on. And the other place they latched on were narratives of the anti hero. Mm-hmm. And I know you, you like yeah. you were talking about like breaking bad or these type of yeah. th- these type of shows. How is it that in a post religious environment where there's not the shared merit narrative, you have the emergence of the anti hero uh as Essentially, the the antagonist for 
multiple shows. You know, I've always been impressed with Rudolf Otto and what he does. I, I find this guy just an amazing theologian, uh, you know, early 20th century, uh, his idea of, of the holy and the ability by which you're just kind of thrown against the experiences. You're backed up against things that terrorize you. You find yourself bumping into a boundary that sets in motion that there's got to be something out there. And, and I find those kinds of um, cultural experiences fascinating because they scream the presence of theology in our, our, our popular cultural world. We do it all the time. We bust our butts on the guardrail of life, and we sit there in a stunned kind of experience of, oh my gosh, uh, I'm conscious, and I'm the, as far as I know, the only being on this planet that's that conscious of my limitations, and it's just momentary. So it brings you to those questions of origin and purpose and destiny that David was talking about. Um, I find this just a fascinating realm in which we are kind of pulled into the narratives. Uh, and it's as deeply theological as it is fictional in any, any other form. Yeah. In the final for the class I taught, uh, I, I, I used to do classes on point systems. So if you just want to be, you don't write a paper poorly and make me read it. Um, so you can kind of pick what assignments you want to do and I like, do, do your that. best. That sounds great. And, and one, and I always let them have essay finals because then if you're like me and grew up dyslexic, uh, uh -huh, yeah. like, yeah, yeah. then I'm like, just let me do an in-class essay and you know I'm dyslexic. Yeah, you can't get all worked up if I can't spell uh -huh. and leave out two uh -huh. and three letter words. Um, otherwise the American Disabilities Act will let you know about it. But, uh, <laughs> And some people just stress about doing something. Uh, like, I turned in the first version of my dissertation, and my advisor said, could you get rid of half of it and hurry up and defend it because you wow. wasted too much time? Um, and so if you just have the option of doing a final for nerds, like, I, I'm like, oh, this is great. I don't have to, like, do this thing I'll overwork myself on. So I did this final, and all the people that I talked into doing it, because I'm like, I love in-class finals. It, you don't have to prepare at all. Just bring whatever you learned from the class and answer the questions. There are five questions. Answer as many you want. And one of them was, what's a question you cultivated in this class that you don't know the answer to? What are the worst answers you can know about it? And what's the one that's most intriguing you still know is wrong? <laughs> and the best 19-year-old essay I've ever read, he watched The Walking Dead yeah. and had binge watched. hadn't seen any of it. And uh, and he said, the question I don't know the answer to uh, is, what is distinctively human? Mm. Mm. Now, he gives the dis – like, he does, like, the science stuff correctly right. about right. Right. how there's much more similarities between us and other species and all that kind of stuff. Right. Right. But then he said he, – he goes into this whole thing, uh, and he said, uh, I think that's the biggest the biggest question Rick as a character puts to me yeah. and Carl. And then he explores Rick and Carl's relationship. Rick, you know, now if you don't know, I'm sorry, spoiler alert. Uh oh. Uh, take like is this like this counter narrative to Shane early on in The Walking Dead and the zombie apocalypse, where he's like, "No, we got standards. We're cops." Blah 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 blah. And then like four seasons later in the TV show, is literally biting his opponent and killing people he's never met to protect his own. Which is what Shane was advocating from the very beginning. Like, he becomes a zombie before he dies. Yeah. And then he goes, and Carl, who's this kid, who the community keeps trying to protect the innocence of the kid, becomes the one that's, like, straight, especially if you read the comments. Like, he's like, I got this. Cock, cock. And, like, he doesn't have any of that old guilt around things and has a much more tribal sense of loyalty where it's hyper fidelity to those you could trust and almost none if you don't because in that coming of age period in for Carl in the comics and some in the show but they ruined it at the end of the last season <laughs> and I hope they reevaluate that whole way the last season ended are you talking about the last season or the s s mid season break or the bite yeah the bite. mid season break right. yeah okay. what's up with that <laughs> Like, I'd rather you have killed Glenn earlier than ruin Carl. Carl's the main character of the comics. The whole becomes a story about Carl. Like, what does it mean to be human if you come of age in a world without the structures of modernity, of democracy, and, and law, and all that kind of stuff? It's like you just ruined the whole reason we're doing this. Anyway. Yeah. 
AMC, screw you. But, <laughs> yeah. but so he, it, he analyzes her two characters and then says this. I, I want to say this is good when I see injustice, but I don't know if I'm speaking someone else's words they taught to me before I could speak. Mm-hmm. I want to say this is wrong, but I ask the same question. I want to tell my fiance I love you, but is it just the genes that are talking? And he starts going through this list of questions. And I had not been so depressed and impressed at the same time. <laughs> and what I when I came from it, I thought, what does it mean as Christians who want to articulate the human beings are made in the image of God? And that this is a creation of a good and loving God when if you form the questions most deeply, they don't just ask like we used to, who is who is God? They ask, is God, Mm -hmm. which, you know, underneath the word God, you have good purpose, all those uh, all the master signifiers. Yeah. Yeah. Your question about who is God reminds me of the quote, who's Negan? And so that that's a whole nother. Okay, that is so meta awesome. If you are a real nerd, you just like. <laughs> All right, go ahead. No, I, 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 you know, one of the things, one of the narratives that repeats itself so often in our popular culture, that is straight from the biblical text, is the is the sacrifice of Isaac. Mm-hmm. And at one point, Negan basically tells Rick to sacrifice his son or his son's hand. Spoiler alert. Um, but. And so I, I can't watch that, and now I can't read the text without same. having the echo of that story. The same thing happens, well, kind of happens in The Last Jedi. There, there are so many places where that, that narrative just springs up again. And you know, part of the question I have is, is that a conscious choice by the writer? You know, That's the biblical scholar in me. Is that authorial intent? Or is that just something that the culture is is a is a meta narrative of the culture that just kind of keeps popping up? What is it? What does it mean to sacrifice our children? Who's asking us to sacrifice our children and that kind of thing? And how are we doing that? Yeah, not to bring the room down. We hope everyone goes home and kisses their children. Um, all right. So la- last question: How does the new Star Wars film and give enough details if you have not watched the newest one? Reread the role of religion and how it's reinterpreted and received in our contemporary context. I'll just answer it by saying I can relate very well to Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi. And most most people of my uh, generation or a lot of people in my generation are extremely upset. But I can understand his kind of search for meaning in the religious structures uh, and it, the Jedi Order, um, his kind of clinging to certain teachings and thinking that that's exactly how th- that how he should reestablish the Jedi Order, and then coming to this crisis moment and and breaking, and that just makes that makes a lot of sense, I think, from a Generation X perspective on uh, on faith and faith communities. So that's how I'll answer your question. That's not the question you asked, but. That's a good answer to your yeah. All right, then I'm going to ask a follow-up. So <laughs> if you haven't seen the movie, there's this like tree that has all the Jedi books in it, and it makes a big deal about it. And then the first time I cried in the movie, uh, Luke is going to take down the tree that had the Jedi sacred text in it on this special hidden island with Jedi stuff. And uh, Yoda shows up. You know, When the screen comes down and you see the back of Ho- Yoda's head, I'm just like... <laughs> It's Yoda. He needs to be here right now. And if you're if you're a Baptist, Yoda turns out to be James Dunn from the Baptist Joint Committee. Yoda's James Dunn because James Dunn would go in the most serious situations and say the most inappropriately funny things and be unaware that it was offensive to half the people at the table. And Yoda is like looking at Luke and is just like, "Wow, well, we tried that." And we're the one that put the emperor in charge and screwed the whole thing up. You know, like, he's like, yeah, we did that. Like, what's the big deal? She already has everything she needs. Now, you find out the second time you watch the film. which well, re- Real geeks find out the first time. But. Oh, you know. 
my dad and I had an argument in the car that that Ray had already stolen the books out of the out of the the sacred tree or whatever, um, and and takes them off and puts them in the Millennium Falcon. But you're like sitting there like, oh, they're all burning you. She has what she needs and all this kind of stuff. And then I thought that her stealing the books and putting in the Millennium Falcon is the best image of theological education today. Because what your goal is as students, as ministers, as leaders in congregation is to hijack all the life-giving parts in this giant tree of Christendom, most of which needs to be burnt down. And if you're a really wise old teacher, you're totally cool to call down the force lightning on it and laugh at all the people, probably on the Illumination Committee, who thought that... Um, who, you know, they, they thought, like, this is a reasonable uh, a way of dealing with our tradition. It's like getting a text message 30 of the 40 years through the wilderness, and uh, that's why it didn't make canon. Um, so, the, like, he takes, he does, like, the force lightning and stuff, and then you find out that his cynicism, Luke's, that the force actually isn't this giant binary of good versus evil. That it actually is this thing that animates life and connects life and puts us all together in one network of community. And that to know the good is to actually know the evil within you. And that to encounter the evil is also to recognize the good in it. Yeah. That this giant arbitrariness of life in the middle of it, to really seize its power deeply is to recognize that the good and evil is in both in you and out of you. And that to be a leader in the future post-Christendom is to steal all the beautiful text and stories but to put it in the vessel of subversion, namely the Millennium Falcon. Because what is the Millennium Falcon but the symbol of resistance? It anticipated imperial critique by being the vessel of a little scoundrel who used to like, oh, that's the trade laws, whatever. You know, it's like, I'm a smuggler. He never really bought into the empire, but played nice when he had to, manipulated when the other ways, because he never knew those laws were final, because he served some other law he knew not yet. And then what's the Millennium Falcon do? It doesn't really buy into the Jedi religion in Episode Four. Han Solo's like, I'm not going to play in your little Force games, you little mumbo-jumbo magic people. But what's he do? Oh, Han Solo... He comes back at episode four, and he runs Wingman, takes out Darth Vader's TIE fighter. So the true believer, Luke, can drop that right into the middle of the Death Star. What we need today are more Han Solo Christians. They don't want to play Jedi Puritanism. They just want to have a vessel where you build small communities of resistance that stick it to the Empire and are practice hybridity and multiplicity when it comes to Jedi religion. And they are, what are they? They're funded by the secret Wookiee philosopher, Chewbacca, who in episode nine is going to remove a arm. He's going to back at that. And set the force to right. And who is it that sets the force to right nonviolently this time? Not Chewbacca, because he ripped an arm off because you took out Han. It's Ray. Yes, Ray. And Ray, if you uh, track the. A anger around the new star. The alt right ran a whole like hate campaign on the new Star Wars because there were all these people of color and women winning. And then I was like, "Yeah, but what about Admiral Akbar? Like he's been rocking for the whole time. Like the whole Star Wars universe is full of people from other races we've never even invented yet. No one in Star Wars knew you could be racist because most of the people they went and died with spoke languages they didn't understand." Yeah. You have projected your white backwardness on them for years. And finally, at the very beginning of the new one, you get so awkward, you have to organize online hate. And so stop watching Star Wars. That's my theory. Is uh, the alt-right wow. should just stop watching Star Wars altogether and leave it to people who aren't racist, homophobic, and are okay with very powerful women who go into, like, speed power right through a giant Star Destroyer. So say we all... I just, but I, the other time I cried, and I want to know as a fan, so when R2 goes to Luke, and he's like, R2's trying to get him to go, and then shows the callback 
to like help me Obi Wan, you're my only hope. As I, as a Hebrew Bible professor in the age of Trump, like what Hebrew callback moment are you wishing every biblical R two D two fan at a church? Who's like, we got to be a biblical congregation. All of a sudden, like, is it Amos that pops up? Is it Micah? Like, who needs to pop up and make us all feel awkward for missing the completely obvious commitment to white privilege in the congregations that we're a part of? The final question in the book of Jonah would be the question. Shouldn't I care about all these people? And even their animals? Excellent. You have such short answers in <laughs> but so It's called the economy of language. Yeah. You know, that's one way of doing it. But it's not always the best. No. Like, you, you've no. got to pick your moments. I save all my economy for arguments with my partner. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I hear what you're saying. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Um, I found I'm not excellent at that. That's what 15 years uh, gets into you is the ability to apologize. Uh, so, yeah, I've been married 15 years. This is our 15th anniversary. Uh, no, she's not here, so don't clap. It was a lot easier for me. Um, okay, that you gave such that a wasn't short, the last question. No, it wasn't. I got one more. I got one more, and this is important because I, I have a. I, I think this. I've regularly had people that aren't into reading comic books or into binge-watching shows that start on Sci-Fi Channel or something like that. If someone's sitting there and going, they really seemed into this, but I'm completely not a geek at all, and uh, I mostly giggle at the fact that they were that entertained talking about that. (laughs) And you're like, are you a real theologian? You should check out this run of this comic or this binge watch this show which one you think will seize their theological imagination with gusto um i think if you want to get back to the power of narrative um and if you want to i can go all genres with this um but i would check out the work of neil gaiman um his work in the sandman um and the power of narrative in that um his work in american gods um despite the uh the rather salacious show that just came out. Um, but uh, he asks those questions and asks them in a very postmodern context, asks questions about all of the different kinds of gods that the people who settled in, in North America brought um, and uh, asks about their death and dying um, and the rise of new gods in a post-technological age. So I would I would look at Sandman and American Gods uh, by Neil Gaiman. Uh, the great answer. All right, now you're going to thank them and welcome Dr. Slater and Dr. Holmes. I'm going to actually stick to the three questions I was going to ask our Bible scholars in the house. Mm -hmm. But there are three narrative promptings, and you all can decide after I ask it who wants to answer first. But the goal is, as as scholars who, who have had a relationship with Scripture, your life that is both out of your own faith out of their practice in a religious community, out of a, the scholars, the, the scholarly community, and as your, your individual as a scholar and a disciple, I want to kind of hear how that relationship with Scripture has changed over your life. Because one of the difficulties of being in theological education is that most of the textbooks are built to introduce you to academic criticism, and it, it can be experienced as taking the Bible away from you as it first was handed to you. And one of the difficulties is figuring out post-criticism, post-critical thinking and such, how the text becomes sacred again or stewards the spirit in your life. Um, And I think that is a lot harder thing to communicate, uh, you know, rather than explaining source criticism for the first time or whatever, or... or, uh, uh, the Q theory for around the New Testament and such. So 
uh, you know, lean into your pastoral, I'll tell a story and help explain this self. Tell me uh, when in your own life, like, and you can give us the background you think is necessary, that Scripture became something worth giving your life to studying. Um, wow. I think I'm going to answer your first question. Uh, About source criticism? And I think the first question was, how did Scripture become sacred again? My answer is, Scripture never stopped being sacred. My understanding of what sacred is changed. Uh Uh-oh. But Scripture never stopped being sacred. And what I came to learn was that when you come out of a graduate program where you've been asked all these questions that are religious in nature, you go to, then you go to teach, and you go to teach in a context which is theological in nature. Mm -hmm. Now, that may seem like synonymous terms for some people, but religion is a much wider term uh, for me. And uh, we have to really realize, and I think this is a problem for theological education, we have to really realize that we shouldn't um, merely ask when we're looking for people for faculty members on in divinity schools and theological schools, we shouldn't merely ask if people are ordained or have they been to seminary. We should ask them faith questions. You know, it's all right to ask them to stand up and read a paper and see if they got the the stuff to do that. But we should be asking them faith questions. And I think one of the real shortcomings of theological education in the 20th century is that we prepared people to be scholars and forgotten how to prepare people to be ministers in a scholarly setting. Oh, I completely agree with you. (laughs) That was like the meta reason I was going to ask the three questions I was going to (laughs) ask. I won't name the school, but it wasn't Mercer. But uh, in my graduate studies, I was the the student representative on a faculty search. And there were three professors in the finals for biblical studies professor. And they were like, so what question do you have? And my question was, um, well, tell me about your participation and what you've learned in the current congregation you worship with and the individual you would most want me to ask for a recommendation. And if you have an idea what they would say, tell me. And only one of the three had an answer that didn't make you go, I don't want you talking to my future minister. Not because you're not an excellent scholar, but because in a, in a world where you've developed all these critical theories and ways of engaging scripture, the, the thing that's hardest to learn for people smart enough to get into a divinity school isn't how to be critical. It's how to use your whole brain and pray at the same time. <laughs> yes. And that's what that line when you said the scripture never stopped being sacred. Like, like at this point, I want to say yes, but there were plenty of years I didn't know if I had an ally in my, bi- my biblical studies class to help me figure that out. Yeah, well, I understand that. Um, we, one, of the, one of the things that really indicates, for me, the problem in theological education is that you can go around the country in, the, in theological schools uh, in just about any denomination you want, and it's hard to get a, a Ph.D. that will uh, in something like church leadership mm-hmm. or evangelism or uh, sometimes even Christian education. But all these seminaries will tell you they're there for the church. Like, who's preparing teachers to teach pastors to be good leaders? Who's connecting the dots between ethics and pastoral care and counseling? I don't see anybody out there preparing that and doing that. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we aren't making disciples as much as we're making followers. So how do you how do you all both take that challenge in your own relationship as a scholar and a disciple uh, in in the classroom? Because I also know that your wife is a Presbyterian minister, right? Yeah, you've been doing your research. I use the internet. Mm -hmm, The internet. I use the Google. It has told me such. Yep. Um, So as as individuals who you know are committed in both realms, like. What is it like to wrestle with those questions and prepare a syllabus? 
So I think uh, I was talking with somebody today about I think one of the challenges is that we've been formed as uh, faculty members to form other faculty members. We spent most of our lives in doctoral programs to teach people how to be scholars of the New Testament. And last time I looked around, most pastors don't want to be biblical scholars. Um, and so there is this major translation that has to happen into actual skills that folks need to happen and I'm, or folks need to have. And I'm grateful that I'm married to a, a person who is in ministry full time because she keeps me honest in thinking about what I do in my classes. Um, I think it's helpful to be involved in a local congregation and uh, teaching in adult education or preaching every once in a while. But uh, I don't know. I think the the sort of the year in year out revision of syllabi is always this question of how does this actually help people preach the gospel in a meaningful way? How does this help the these sacred writings from ancient times come alive and speak to people's very particular and very real situations? Um, and, and, and how do we, how do we prepare people to think theologically, not only about scripture, but about situations like school zoning in Southeast Atlanta or, um, you know, how, how tax dollars are used or all of these things, which scripture doesn't really talk about, right? We, that's the, the element of using your imagination that you have to sort of think creatively with scripture uh, to get to some of those those answers that scripture doesn't give you the answer to. And so helping folks, uh, and, and, and actually I learn a lot just through the questions that my students ask and realizing that, wow, those are not the questions that I have. And so I need to think more with my students rather than um, thinking that I have all of these great questions to ask for them. When you think of students like five years out, of uh, spending time as a scholar, what what are those nuggets of nerdy wisdom you hope they have ringing in their head while they're also thinking of the stories of families in their congregation they're trying to speak life into, to questions that are, are arise in culture in the particular times? Like, what are the the questions of a faithful nuisance you hope that your engagement with them around the New Testament uh, linger? I'm still thinking. Okay, okay. Yeah, faithful nuisance. Uh, I think I would think of two. One is, uh, at the end of the day, I think what I've sort of planted my my flag on is that my students would understand themselves as interpreters of Scripture, that their, their confidence as interpreters of Scripture would grow. But that they would have to own their interpretations of Scripture, that that they uh, are making sense of these ancient texts, and they're doing so in a particular way through through and with particular communities of faith. But that they have to own that. That it's it they they can't just sort of pass it off on the Bible and say the Bible says. Mm-hmm. But they also have to own like I've read this text in this particular way, and I'm choosing to prioritize this text rather than this text, and it makes sense for me in this way. And it uh, and I think the second then would be that they would recognize that other folks make sense of Scripture in a different way um, and that they can begin to develop sort of the empathetic understanding of other people's attempts to make sense out of Scripture, even as they grow in their own confidence and certainty in saying, this is my stand and this is where I'm coming at with Scripture. Um, and whether it's gender issues or human sexuality, um, that they that they are able to recognize that they have a constructive role in reading these texts and um, that there are consequences of those readings of text, that those readings can uh, can lead to justice and flourishing, that those readings can lead to um, the opposite of those things. And that I think five years out, I hope my students realize that, man, I, I am responsible for my interpretation. Sunday after Sunday, I am making sense of these scriptural texts for ancient or for contemporary communities that want to hear a word from God from these ancient texts. I would say that uh, the the struggle for faith that's already in the scripture, the human struggle for faith, uh, is the thing that I try to bring home to my students. I want the students to know that sometimes, even in scripture, people disagree for good reasons. Mm-hmm and that they are living by faith inside this sacred story, just like we're living by faith. And sometimes good people will make the wrong decision. But you just ask for forgiveness and go on. 
Hmm. Forgiveness is not always the easiest thing to do. And um, one of the challenges I think that the church is dealing with is how we re-engage texts that we made off limits because we're embarrassed about how they were normally dealt with. And with, the first time I interviewed Walter Brueggemann, I got to the end and, and uh, he, I said, so what question should I ask you? So you say something that's really cool like Walter Brueggemann wants to say because I don't think you've actually answered any question I asked <laughs> and it's clear you want to talk about something. And he's like, how old are you? And I was, I was like, 29? He's like, when you're 30, you won't ask me that question. <laughs> but ask me what text I used to love that I loved and I now love again with a completely different reading. And then I said, Dr. Brueggemann, most wise one, what text do you love now? They used to love in a completely different way. And you've come back to loving and cherishing it again with a completely different interpretation after wrestling with it. And, and I asked that just because uh, um, for a while after I finished divinity school, I functioned as uh, I was working at a church with lots of divinity school interns and such. And the thing I noticed they most came to me wasn't a theology question cause, or church history question. It was, what do I do with a text that gave me life and it's how I got here that I now don't even read it that way anymore? And yet I'm still here because some preacher preached a bad exegeted sermon about this passage. And I want to say yes to that experience without keeping everything that it included. Uh, as scholars, like what is a text that... Ha, its meaning has changed because of your commitment as a person of faith and as a, as a, a constant kind of a, a academic quester of sorts. Yeah, uh, and Jesus wept. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I just want you to know, if your dissertation was on uh, 19th century existentialist interpretations of the New Testament, that could totally be a legit yeah, no, answer. No, that wasn't my dissertation. <laughs> My dissertation was far less interesting. Um, I guess I would say, I don't know if I would, I would pick a single text, but I, was, I grew up in a Presbyterian church that uh, swung sort of evangelical in Colorado Springs. And, and I, remember, um, I remember vividly the summer that you know, I sort of made my, had my conversion experience at one of these summer camps. Uh, and it was like the third summer in a row that I had had that conversion experience. <laughs> and so, so whatever those scriptural texts are, uh, you know, that, that lead, uh, uh, hormonal junior hires, uh, to think that they are the worst people that have ever lived, um, uh, and that they are directly responsible for all of the vivid pain that Jesus endured uh, through the crucifixion, which has been preached at you for an hour. That whole bit would be the the scriptural themes that uh, that I have come back to in another way, in the sense of uh, you know, uh, my wife and I have had many loud conversations about theology with our children at the table. And we've had to look at our kids and say, no, wait, you just need to know that God loves you. Mommy and daddy are fighting right now, but what matters, <laughs> what matters is that God loves you. That's all you need to hear because our kids have ears. And so, <laughs> truth, they do. They have two of them each. Um, but, but I think, you know, one of the things we've talked about has been atonement theories. And, of course, at the dinner table, right, with five-year-olds and three-year-olds, because that's what you do. Um, and, and that's one of those places where I've come back, and I, and I don't understand atonement theory in the same way that I probably understood it as a seventh grader, as it was preached to me, and, and my need and my guilt in sort of inflicting this pain upon uh, Jesus and his crucifixion. Uh, but I've come back to and, and, and see in a different way, and it's still in a distinctly Christian way, but perhaps without the uh, angry, uh, wrathful God that I was brought up believing in. Um, 
I'm glad he went first. I thought you would talk about uh, maybe some contemporary theological uh, text. Uh, good answer. Thank you. I feel like I'm on Family Feud. <laughs> uh, um, <coughs> um, the, my, my text would be uh, from Ezekiel 37. Son of man, can these bones live? And uh, that's been an important text for me for, for many years. And my understanding of the text has evolved over the years. I've probably preached from it at least a dozen times in various settings. And I have never preached the same sermon twice. But it was sacred every time. Every time. It was meaningful every time. I remember once I preached it at a high school reunion. I've never had a high school reunion with a sermon before. That's right. <laughs> I've actually you're, never been to a high school reunion. Well, yet. you need to go to my high school reunion. <laughs> yes. I, you would be welcome. So, so I want to know what the high school reunion Ezekiel sermon sound, uh, sounds like. Like, when you're going into that, you're like, "You aged well, you didn't. I'm amazed you're still employed." But Ezekiel, well, spirit of the living God. <laughs> wow. No, too soon. Too soon. Sorry. <laughs> Well, it's a school that is now no longer there. It's an elementary school. And for about 30 years, it was an all-black district. For about 30 years, people who lived uptown in the other district, and they were our arch rival, were telling us every year, next year, you're going to have to go to school uptown with us. The school lasted another 20 years after I preached that sermon. Um, and it really was a very, very important time for all of us because we'd just gotten a new superintendent and people were wondering with this new person in charge what the future of the school might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, thank you for sharing the stories, their insights, your own life and experience with Scripture, um, especially for those that are listening that are clearly interested in theological reflection but have no idea uh, what it looks like to you know, do it full time for three years. Uh, it's always exciting to find out that there are allies in keeping this the scripture sacred throughout the whole deconstructive, reconstructive, reimagining journey. And uh, so, if you feel alone, Mercer clearly has people that are ready to uh, uh, run sidekick for that uh, journey. Right, that's and right. So, join me in thanking Dr. Slater and Dr. Holmes. And Greg has something he's going to say as Rob and Nikki come up here. I'm going to narrow what I was going to ask down to three questions because that works so well. I just say that. It's not true. I just feel like at a theology podcast, if you say you're going to do three things, it feels Trinitarian. And it makes everyone at ease, you know. And if you use the microphones, it'll really help. So you can't get too close, but you can be too far away. Okay. And remember, just like God is always with you, you can always be with the microphone. 30 years ago, it made a lot of sense to go to divinity school because there were churches that paid you with options. Um, the easy question. Yeah. So I'm hanging out with Jesus, asking questions and stuff. I'm not sure I get to ask him at my church unless I go to one of few churches in the city I live in. And yet, the story of Jesus inspires me to serve. And I want to know, like, is there a type of ministry I could give myself to, have integrity at the same time, and still afford my health insurance? And now I feel bad for you that are third years, and the answer doesn't, isn't satisfactory. <laughs> But how do you understand the changing shape of what it means to have a, a ministerial vocation today in light of all that's changing economically, culturally, and in the church? Well, we talk about vocation and the clergy. And I wonder if we really ought to be talking about vocation and the church. Um, because I really think part of the challenge 
for the church right now is that it has lost its sense of what it means to truly be called and to be engaging with God in the world. Uh, and so if I had a word to offer uh, to third years, my word to them would be let's stop, I mean, let's really stop thinking about the institutional church. And let's start thinking about how to energize followers of Jesus Christ to transform their communities. Uh, one of the things I say to classes all the time is it's not about the church. It is about the neighborhood. It's about the community. Uh, you said today in my class uh, something like, uh, let's not confuse the community that pays us with the community to which we are called. And I thought that was a pretty powerful word. Um, I had an experience. I went to the wife's Christmas party one time, the spouse's Christmas party, which is a terrible thing to have to go to, right? Because the only people you have anything uh, in common with are the other spouses, and so you find yourself sort of off in the corner with them, and they're saying to you, um, so what do you do? And, uh, you know, I say, after some prodding, well, I'm a religion professor. <laughs> wow, this woman says, a religion professor? That's cool. Uh, so... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm studying my past lives, and I'm trying to figure out who I've been in the past. And uh, Hinduism is really speaking to me. And uh, do you come out of a Christian tradition? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, uh, wow, Jesus must mean everything to you. And I said, well, Jesus Christ does mean a great deal to me, yes. <laughs> And I found myself with no language and no passion <laughs> about Jesus. And I had to go, I really had to go back, this was in about the mid 90s, to rediscover again that passion. The church has lost its passion. Not every church. I'm talking about, I guess, my people. The churches to which I belong and that I experience, and we've lost our passion. And if we as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ can somehow help followers of Jesus rediscover their passion, then I think we're not going to have to worry about churches uh, existing. They're going to be there. They're going to bubble up because of that enthusiasm and the passion that they have. So, Nikki, one of the cool parts about getting a job like yours is when your peers are like, oh, what is the church even going to do in the future and blah, blah, blah. You, like, constantly get to hear the stories of amazing, passionate young people who are, like, lining up to help the church become something more amazing. Mm -hmm. And and you, like, got to, like, deal with, like, Debbie Downer church attender <laughs> and say, like, no, no, no. Just like, trust me, like there's these amazing people that are coming and they're excited. Mm -hmm. And if you like, maybe next time you should try like hiring them <laughs> and, uh, and like Here. letting them actually lead because like they put a lot of work into divinity school. Like you, you should probably listen to them a little bit and trust them. Like when you think of the interaction with people who are being called and still going into preparation theologically for ministry and going into churches, if if they were asking you about watching someone from when they come in and that transformation process and going out, yeah. like what are the, the themes or streams of transformation that you're like, oh, just wait, church. Wait till these people show up. I think I think the first thing I would say to the church and to the people who'd ask me that is don't worry. Um, and that is because of the students who are coming through. But the streams that I'm seeing uh, – come through and that I'm reading in applications um, is an interest in, um, I think there's definitely an interest in making room for everyone at the table, really. Like, not um, most people, not the people who look like us and are just a little different than us, but everybody. 
Uh, and so I think that uh, making room for the voices of everyone is something that I'm seeing. I also find students coming in, uh, a lot of times I will say, I just need somebody who wants to be a pastor to apply. <laughs> Um, and that's because students aren't coming necessarily wanting to pastor in the traditional congregational church, but they are coming with ideas for ministry that we have never heard before. Um, ways to utilize um, all of this great technology like a podcast and social media to connect and create communities. Uh, we have um, very passionate young people coming in interested in starting very creative uh, ministries in which they go all over the world or they're connecting people all over the world uh, and learning from a diverse group of people instead of one voice. And I think that uh, I am also seeing people who are interested in issues related to justice. Uh, and I don't know that that is a new stream. I think that it is being articulated um, by these new students in important ways that matter for now. That's good. So, Rob, what what are the questions that you can't manage to get through a semester without being asked repeatedly that students didn't even think of asking when you first started teaching? Well, I think part of it is what Nikki's already drawn attention to. I think Students come in now with all sorts of diverse experiences. Uh, and it's, you know, I struggle. I mean, I grew up in Asia, in the Philippines. My parents were missionaries. Graham and I are uh, sort of brothers in the MK world. But my education in a homeschool situation, in a on a predominantly Muslim island in the Philippines was less diverse than the experience of my children at Elm Street Elementary School in Rome, Georgia. And the opportunities students have to travel now, uh, mission engagements, uh, study abroad experiences, they bring a wealth of perspective. And so what I love about it is that you never know when you're going to learn something in the classroom because of the power of that diversity. Um, I like to tell a story about uh, being in a, a classroom and uh, Brett Younger had left the altar table. Uh, he was supposed to move it for uh, the preaching uh, class, so it was out of the way. And I uh, backed my prominent rear end back up and I felt the altar behind me and I just popped up on it and sat down and the African American students in the classroom almost in one voice thundered get off the altar Dr. Nash get off the altar and I you know immediately leaped thinking there was some sort of snake or something that was on the <laughs> altar table. And the word to me was, you can't sit on the altar. It's the altar. And we had this powerful conversation about sacred space. And I found myself learning. I'm not sure that happened for me when I started teaching 25 years ago. But I think the power of the diverse classroom and the power of all those experiences together make me a constant learner. And that's what I love about it. All right, this question's for both of you. Um, before, it, it, like you both had uh, positions before you came to Mercer and were day to day with students, like working in a denomination, working in classroom, and this type of thing. Um, what what is the the shift of your own piety, your own hope, your own expectations for the life of the church, having spent time with the students you're serving? And, and, and I ask that because a lot of potential students thinking about theological education that listen to the podcast that talk to me, 
will ask questions where their reservations for joining the theological education process isn't because they have a bunch of classes on their list they don't want to take or because they don't feel called or they aren't excited. It's because they wonder if the experience of theolo- in theological education where the community be as will it feel as oppressive to your theological imagination as a lot of their church experience like will there be parts of my life I don't get to voice mm-hmm. will there be questions that don't get externalized and I constantly kind of advocate that uh, no like if you ask those questions the church has this wonderful place where you get to do it now I would hope that more congregations become places where uh like doubts, questions, and critical reflection are an essential part of a vibrant faith, not a threat to it. But being a part of a community where there are people that are questioning all sorts of things about their identity and want to work it out in that theological environment, what would you what would you say to them? Uh, I'm thinking. Okay. <laughs> I've got ideas, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what I love about my teaching now is that something has happened, and I'm going to, this is my context, McAfee School of Theology. Something is happening in that context in which very conservative students and very liberal students and students who run the gamut from one end to the other are somehow able to come together in the classroom and have a discussion about LGBTQ issues and go to work on each other and to listen to each other say, you know, here's why I don't think women ought to be pastors and to have other folks take them on with that and to have that argument go on in the space where we learn to listen to each other. Um, And sometimes it it goes off the skids and folks are so angry about what they've heard one way or the other, but somehow we come back together and we find some grace in it. I guess that goes back to the whole diversity conversation we had just a moment ago. Somehow in our educational system, When it's done well in a lot of communities, we're able to get to those places and we're able to become a model, hopefully, for the church in the future. And that's what makes it great. I don't know if this answers your question. I think it does. All right. (laughs) Good. Um, you, You asked at the beginning of your question about our own personal piety and kind of how it has shifted and changed. Um, And I will say that coming to McAfee, um, I was excited about uh, coming back to McAfee to work with incoming students. I was excited to work with students who were getting ready to pursue the degree that I had already completed. Mm -hmm. So here in that, I knew all the stuff that they were about to learn, right? But being at McAfee, listening to the students that we have here, there is it is rare that the day goes by that I do not learn something new from the students who are at McAfee. And I'm not even in the classroom all that very often, but it is in the conversations that happen in the hallway. It is in um, conversations about their applications in my office. It is in watching them care and love for one another and way love one another in ways that, um, that humble me. And so for me, uh, I have, grown deeply simply by watching and listening to our students because they know collectively so much more than I do. And so their collective wisdom in the classroom feeds on one another and they learn from one another and I learn from them. And so I think that for me, um, humility has become a very important part um, of my own experience here in this world of theological education. Oh, well, that's that's beautiful. Oh, thanks. Well, I don't know if most of the people here that are Mercer students realize what kind of compliment you just gave them because they didn't say you're welcome. But uh, we join me in thanking Rob and Nikki while Jeff and Gushy 
are coming up here. So, the world's most interesting ethics professor. Thank you very much. I, I, and um, the dean. Now, and I say that because you and I have a shared professor who was a different type of dean. Dirty Indeed. Dean Martin. Indeed. And uh, it, it's rare that you get Baptists in a room who can uh, have a shared experience of having a class with photocopies of Paul Homer text Absolutely. because they're not in print anymore. Correct. But, uh, Speaking of shared experience, are you aware that uh, the most interesting man in ethics and I went to high school, the Whoa. same high school? Okay. Yes, yeah. we both went to high school. Yes, we did. Almost together. David's much older than I am. Considerably older. Almost a year. And so we, we were in the same high school growing up. I didn't know David that well. We were in Fellowship of Christian Athletes together for a short time, but uh, we, we really never had much time together. He was in the advanced classes. Uh, I was in the remedial classes. <laughs> But that's why I'm his boss. <laughs> so I've, been, uh, I've enjoyed being able to work with this most interesting man in ethics. So um, your students, without attaching names, have sent a host of questions. Ooh. And now you may be saying to yourself, I don't want to on the spot answer a question that could be held against me later as if it was binding for the School of Theology. So... We're going to do answer the Ask Mercer Anything questions. So it's AMA, because on the Internet, if you do Ask Me Anything, it's AMA. Not because you are essentialized Mercerdom, but just for the initials. Um, but one of you will get 60 questions. You'll take turns answering the question first. And then the other one will answer the question disagreeing with the person who answered first for 60 seconds. The Instead of casting lots to decide what the Holy Spirit thinks the correct answer is, I will ask you to clap for the most interesting ethics professor or the zestiest Wittgensteinian <laughs> dean of a Baptist divinity school. Amen. Um, so um, uh, Gushy gets to go first for the first question. And this was the most popular question, and that's why I thought you should get to decide what answer he has to give. Now, you feel free to opt out of this, but it was literally the most popular, and I realize this is awkward, so I just want to say that up front. But nine different people asked, why don't you hire Dr. Chris Holmes to be a tenured professor? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, do you want me to answer? No, no, you got to go second, so you have to disagree with whatever he says. I will, don't worry. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Chris Holmes is uh, too qualified to teach Christian uh, scripture at the McAfee School of Theology. <laughs> He's certainly too qualified to teach, but in addition, the alumni are not giving as strongly as they might, or it would be more possible... Oh, well played. Every senior minister in stewardship season, give him an air high five. What, what? All right. Um, all right, here's one. And, and you get to go first. Right. If you could have a visiting professor that is a dead philosopher that's been dead at least 200 years, which one would it be? And what class would they teach? They have to be more than 200 years dead. Trying to do the math in my head. <laughs> If it's hit or miss, I don't think anyone, unless they use Wikipedia, will call you out. Yeah. I, I'm going with, um, I'm going with uh, the, the, the Dane, uh, SK. Um, I, 200 I, years? I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think if we had Soren Kierkegaard, we'd have him come and teach a course on Christian literature. Uh, I believe that answer disqualify, is disqualified in terms of the chronology. How so? <laughs> I will go with Aristotle to teach us some um, philosophy of character. Oh, now if you're saying to yourself as a student, and you're going to go in debt either for the most depressing Danish philosopher of all time, <laughs> who wrote books 
that no one really wanted to read at that time because they were so offensive, like attack upon Christendom <laughs> and training in Christianity. And the only way he managed to, uh, uh, like he was so popular that there was a riot at his funeral. Um, if you want him to hang out with you, then you got to give a holler right here. Wow. Now, <laughs> if you're saying to yourself, more than 200. I want Aristotle. He invented half the sciences. So if I took a class from Aristotle, he also invented biology and physics. So why would I have to learn contemporary physics and biology? Because I basically learned it from the dude that invented it when I took this one class when I was in seminary. And he was 200 years ago. More than 200 years ago, Aristotle. Let's hear it for Aristotle. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What's up with the mind-body problem? Like, I don't want a solution to it. But what the heck is the mind body problem and does it have to, what does it have to do with religion? <laughs> Trip what? has lost control here, ladies and gentlemen. We know this. <laughs> Jeff Jeff knows the answer to this question. <laughs> well, for the long for the longest time, ever since uh David's uh fascination with Aristotle, uh there's been an <laughs> there's been an interest in in uh, associating those things that are um, shall we say, eternal and unchanging and divine with, with the mind or the intellect or what can be known uh, by the intellect. And so as a consequence throughout Christian history, uh, the mind has, the soul, the mind, the intellect has been associated with drawing close to God, being closer to that which is divine, finding oneself in communion with the divine. And, and our good friend uh, Augustine got us going in that direction. However, uh, as, as, as that world uh, committed to universals began to collapse, uh, committed to uh, posited realities that were transcendent, as we uh, started to uh, adopt the scientific method and decide that everything that was real was made of just stuff, then we found ourselves in a bit of a bind. We felt like trying to get to the truth of what it meant to connect with God was somehow associated with the body as well. And so we had to solve the problem. Well, <sighs> Shall I try it? Oh, yeah. I think what's fascinating about the mind-body problem is that we don't even know what we are. We human beings don't even know what we are. We know that we are physical. We know that there is something that we think transcends the physical, and we've been trying to theorize that ever since we came to human consciousness, and we still don't know the answer. I think that's fascinating. Oh, I'm just glad nobody lapsed into the science and the way that debate connects to the mind-body problem. Or uh, <laughs> You have to do that before the second beer. Um, <laughs> all right. Now, this is a doozy. When we argue about theology and stuff, we use words. But how do the words connect to anything that's true? Or is there traction between our language and something eternal? Or is it just things we move around, fight about, and then decide after people leave the church what color our carpet's going to be? Is that a real question? <laughs> yes. Uh, what's the language question yeah. is an essential question. Yeah. Am I going first? Yep. Um, in ethics, we deal with um, the complexity of, of language problems all the time, um, and that would be true in other areas too. Um, what do we even describe a phenomenon as as we are attempting to analyze it and the shifting nature of language that's certainly – Obvious when it comes to all kinds of questions, race, uh, sexuality, uh, you name it. Um, I am persuaded that, in a sense, the philosophers are right who suggest that discourse occurs within a kind of a context of language. And if you're not in that linguistic context, a community of conversation that has agreed to use certain words in certain ways, you're not in the game. You're not, you're not in the conversation. Um, but it's interesting um, how, how many moral issues are decided in part by what's, what resolutions are made related to language issues. When we move to 
homosexuals to LGBT persons, uh, much had already changed by the time that decision was made. Um, and, and the same is true on, on all kinds of other issues. Even today when we talk about immigration, are we talking about dreamers? I'll be in a forum in Macon tomorrow night on dreamers. That is, are we call, are we talking about dreamers, that is children who were brought here by their parents? Or are we talking about illegal immigrants who are violating American laws? So discourse decisions are fundamental uh, in both theology and ethics. The, the trouble with uh, the relationship between language and reality and how that bears out for us, Christianly speaking, and uh, our own interest in ensuring that we are associated with what's true or right or good um, whenever philosophers and ethicists and theologians introduce the context for uh, linguistic movements or shifts, there's often a reaction that, that goes something like this. But yeah, how do you know it's true? If, if it's all context dependent, if yeah. it's socially constructed, if it derives its meaning from that particular circumstance in that particular time and that particular place, then how in the world do you know that what you're associating with or what you're giving yourself is true? And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of anxiety right now about what happens to the church and what happens to us as believers if we acknowledge that what Dr. Gushi is arguing for is the case. I happen to agree with him. But if but the counter argument is that, you know, is the truth shifting on us? And if it is, how can we be confident? Yeah. All right. So these are quick questions because all three this individual submitted have so much depth. You can do it quickly. Do dogs go to heaven? I don't think that heaven is the relevant question. I would say you're working with. Like, I, I, I would say that there's absolutely no question that dogs are in heaven. Um, uh, well, what great, about cats? The great reformer. <laughs> now that's different. We go higher up with cats. There's Look, no question about that. In Christianity, that. when we speak of heaven, we speak of those things that give us joy and happiness and meaning. And so what does cats have to do with that? <laughs> does uh, Jesus watch me go poopy? There are some philosophers who think that when Christians say something like, God is watching me, that somehow that mitigates the meaningfulness of Christianity because it just sounds silly because it sounds like God is watching me go poopy. <laughs> but if you, if you watch how Christians actually behave and you take your cues about what they mean by what they say by how they behave, then I don't know too many people who are building extra dark rooms in which to take a shower to ensure that the divine's not peeking in. So, no, he doesn't have any interest in your poopy. That's some of the best theology I've heard in a long time. All right. Well, last one is, uh, what does postmodern mean and why should it even matter? You go first. You're going to totally save Is me an entire time? graduate degree. Um, Postmodern means that we are no longer committed to a universal notion of reason, uh, a universal notion of what it means to be a human being, a universal notion of what it means to embrace the good or what is right or what is the truth. And... There are all kinds of ways in which if we pause to recognize the great diversity of uh, meaning in various communities, we recognize that uh, the, the, modern, uh, the modern persuasion or the modern conviction that uh, people think the same and believe the same and are the same fundamentally everywhere is 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 deeply mistaken
Uh, one way to talk about it in ethics is is the idea that in the modern period, philosophers, theologians, believed that they could come up with a uh, a foundation to discern or to determine uh, how one arrives at moral truth that often a theoretical model that if properly applied by any person of reason could arrive at a shared understanding of what is true, right, and good. And we no longer believe that. Now, the last surviving community of people who seem to believe that are conservative Christians um, who believe that if you just interpret the Bible as God's word, then we have the sure foundation to give us uh, direct access to divine truth. And that works perfectly well until we disagree. And then we realize that there's a, it's a linguistic process, it's a community process, and that we see through a glass darkly, and that we are always in an ongoing argument in community, including with the community in the past, related to what is true, right, and good. I think Christians uh, often uh, bought into a modern epistemology and then found themselves in a faith crisis when they realized it didn't work very well. And I think that we can do better than that. In fact, by being an ancient community, we didn't have to be tied into a modern epistemology. And so I say to my students, uh, I'm not going to uh, argue that this is the truth on this or that issue, but I'm going to try to to teach you methods in which to make arguments about what is right and true and good, and then to defend them, and then to dialogue with others who have made different arguments and come up with different conclusions. So give them a hand. And mega thanks to Nathan and Greg for putting this all together.